Good afternoon, everybody. It's Sunday, August 29th, and we are here in Lincoln, Nebraska to talk to two gentlemen, and they are going to talk to us about a dream, a vision they have that uh, they believe would be very, uh, very, a very good um, vision for the state of Nebraska to uh, employ. And um, that vision has uh, something to do very specifically with establishing a commuter railroad linking Omaha and Lincoln. And before we get started uh, listening to what that vision is all about, we would like uh, our two guests today to introduce themselves. So, Robert, would you please tell us uh, a little bit about uh, who you are? Sure. Bob Kozelka, uh, I'm a retired professor from the University of Nebraska, but my interest now primarily is with the, an organization called ProRail Nebraska, which advocates for increased passenger rail service to Nebraska. I'm interested in that because I love riding on trains. I've ridden in Europe, in Australia, in Korea, and in the U.S. a lot of times. And so I'm, some of my colleagues are very interested in a wide range about railroads. I'm interested in them as a means to comfortably travel. Okay, hold that thought. Hold that thought, and we're going to introduce your colleague, and then we're going to get back to uh, that uh, comfort level between Omaha and Lincoln. Uh, Richard, could you please tell us about yourself? Yes, uh, my name is Richard Schmeling. Uh, I live here in Lincoln. Uh, my profession was I practiced law here in Lincoln for about thirty years. I'm now retired. Uh, I am. Uh, the District 1 Director for ProRail Nebraska. And uh, my interest in railroad started when I was about four years old and I became restless and my mother would put me in the car and we'd go down to the local railroad yards. She claims that I learned to read by memorizing the names on the boxcars as the freight train went past. And I lived in a time when every town in Nebraska had rail passenger service, even the smallest towns. Today, we have very little good public transportation in Nebraska, very few options for people, so I'm interested in getting a commuter rail system between Lincoln and Omaha to give people a choice. Okay, good. Then we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about why do you think this makes such good sense from your standpoint Why is it to the benefit of Nebraskans and particularly those who live in this part of the state, what is the advantage of having a commuter railroad between Lincoln and Omaha? Why is that important? Bob, you answer first and then we'll get to Richard. Well, just because of my work in ProRail Nebraska, anytime I tell someone I'm in ProRail Nebraska, they ask me, when is there going to be a commuter rail between Lincoln and Omaha? That's the first thing people think of when they think of railroad here. So as I learn more and more and heard that more, that really is essential. I drive between Omaha and Lincoln, and, and the three lanes on the interstate have made no improvement in how you get to and from Omaha and Lincoln. I talk to people all the time. Uh, just last week, one of my colleagues said, a friend of mine's moving here from Japan. And they want to know how to get, what sort of public transit, what sort of rail is there between Lincoln and Omaha, because they're going to live in Lincoln and work in Omaha. What do I tell them? None. Mm. So I want to change that. Okay. Uh, Richard, what is the advantage? What is the advantage from where you sit? Instead of having a third lane to Interstate 80, what is the advantage of scrapping that idea and going with a commuter railroad? Why is that a good idea? Well, because railroads are, number one, the all-weather mode. We know the interstate can get shut down by storms. We know that the interstate gets shut down when you have auto accidents. The railroad is on its own right away, and the trains may not run exactly on time, but they'll get through. So that's a very big advantage. The other advantage is that if people are riding the commuter trains, it can be productive time. When you're driving, you shouldn't be working with your computer, you shouldn't be texting, you shouldn't be even, perhaps even using your cell phone. But when you're on the train, the trains will have Wi-Fi, you can work on your computer, uh, or you can just simply relax. 
but uh, it's it's time that can be potentially very productive. Okay, and and uh, we are talking about, according to statistics that were just released last week, that essentially seventy percent of Nebraska's population is confined to three counties: Lancaster, right. Sarpy, and Douglas. Yeah, and and there's a this huge hub at both ends, and they need interchange. They need to hear. Uh, I want to go to an opera in Omaha, and I don't want to drive anymore. I'm 83. So I'd like to be able to get on a train, go there, go to the opera, and come back home. And, and I can't do that now. And in the, if we're going to see growth in Nebraska, we're going to have to see better transportation potential between Lincoln and Omaha. And that's not spelled C-A-R. Okay, and Richard, can you uh, add another layer of wisdom to uh, that uh, that remark? I think so, because uh, we used to have, uh, before Amtrak and the private railroads, we used to have things called football specials that would bring people from Omaha to Lincoln for the football games and take them back home. And during the Burlington era, we had as many as four or five special trains. And that shows the ability of rail to move large quantities of people over distance uh, with minimal infrastructure. Mm. And I can move as many passengers per hour on a double track railroad line as you can on 16 lanes of interstate highway. So it just makes sense to have the mode that's going to handle the better debts. Okay, so we're talking about numbers. And according to the data that came out last week, in the last 10 years, Sarpy, Lancaster, and Douglas County have added 136,000 people in those counties. The other 90 counties in Nebraska combined lost 1,000 people in the last 10 years. So all of the growth is in these three counties. And you see that as more compelling evidence of why, instead of adding a fourth lane to the interstate, it makes more sense to add a commuter railroad. Is that uh, cost? Is that cost effective? Well, is that it, going to work? I was going to say that in addition to just the big population, in two surveys we've done with the Nebraska State. Uh, survey of of analysis, Uh, we put in questions in that about a train between Lincoln and Omaha, commuter train. Both times, statewide this is, this isn't just Lincoln and Omaha, it was like 88% one year and 89% the next time, 2016, 2020. So it's, it's more than just Lincoln and Omaha people that want it, it is a statewide desire. You're saying that a survey that's how old? Uh, one was 2016 and one was 2020. So two, first, uh, two, two different surveys, both within the last five years, have indicated overwhelmingly that those respondents to the survey would like to see rail right. service between Omaha and Lincoln. And their respondents across the whole state. Uh, this is done by the wide. Bureau of Sociological Research. Yes, and they are very... Uh, it's a very, very well-respected very, Yes, very well-equipped to do that kind of uh, information. What, um, at this point, since we're citing statistics uh, about the density of traffic and people would much rather be uh, sitting there with a cup of coffee in their laptop uh, and not looking at an 18-wheeler changing lanes in front of them, uh, what do you see as we sit here on August 29th? What are the three biggest obstacles as to why we're talking about this in the future and not talking about it as something that's already happening. There's a myth that when you have a rail system, that the rail system has to be tremendously expensive. And that's true if you're building a new high-speed rail system and you have to condemn land and build a whole new right-of-way. The beauty of Lincoln to Omaha is that we can use the existing Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway track And so we have track and signaling already in place. That's the track that has the Amtrak trains that come through Nebraska. It's good for 79 miles an hour. And so 
about what we're talking about is we're talking about buying some rail equipment of some kind to run on there and do a little station work. We can use the stations in Lincoln and Omaha. The Amtrak stations are perfect, but they're only busy at night when the California Zephyr comes through. Mm -hmm. So they could be used during the daytime for the commuter trains. Okay, so we're talking about a railroad line that already exists between Lincoln and Omaha, not one that has to be built. It's already there. Correct. It's owned by Burlington Northern. Is Burlington Northern an obstacle in making this happen, or could they be a potential partner? They can be a potential partner. When Senator Moorfeld introduced a bill in the legislature in the, the 2000 session, before he introduced the bill to study commuter rail, he visited with Burlington Northern Santa Fe and said, if we were to do this, would you be willing to accept the trains on your line? They indicated that because the coal traffic has dropped down, they now have excess capacity, and they said since we're going to have to maintain this track for Amtrak at 79 miles an hour anyway, yeah, we'd like to have some more trains. Another myth is, you know, you're going to reduce my flexibility of travel. I, I'm not in control anymore. And if you look at the reasons why the 41,000 people that make tri or 41,000 trips that are made between Lincoln and Omaha every day, a vast majority don't move around once they get to where they're going. They work or they do something like that. And both Omaha and Lincoln have, I would say, average to above average public transit systems. I think Omaha is even moving a little beyond that, and Lincoln recently has done that. So if you match a commuter rail system with a pass with a, a in city bus system, you've got very good connections. Okay, so if you project out all of this in terms of the the cars that are needed to be on that railroad owned by Burlington Northern and the bus system that would be needed to connect the destination point with various parts of the city where people work. Is there a number that you've come up with that a commuter rail link between these two cities would ultimately cost? I do not have that number. Uh, I will tell you that, you know, the devil is in the details, and we aren't even to the point where we can talk about the nuts and bolts of the system. The first step is to get the state to say, hey, we need this, let's study it, Let's find out if, if it's feasible, and then we start getting to the point where we talk about how many car train cars do we need, how many runs do we need, at what times of the day, and then you can start putting some cost figures. And, and the bus systems are already underway. You know, they're there. It would just take some maneuvering of their schedules and routes to, to meet what is needed. And the track's already there. And it's a very good grade track, isn't it, Richard? Yes, excellent track. So you mentioned earlier there are 41,000 trips that are made daily, Monday through Friday, between Lincoln and Omaha. What's the source of that data? Uh, that is from the Department of Roads Transportation Study. Okay, and you also have surveys that indicate there's an overwhelming number of Nebraskans who would like to see this happen. We, we've, we've done surveys, and... As I told you, but yeah. but those people who want it to happen apparently are not in the state legislature. No, uh, and we did. So how do you overcome that? Well, we did a survey. I'll tell you one fledgling attempt we had on this. We did a survey of state of candidates for legislature, federal and state, and also the people who were going to remain in office, and we got a pretty poor response. From the federal, on the federal level, I think only one candidate responded, uh, maybe two. And then from the uh, uh, state legislative branch, we got mostly responses from candidates, very few responses from either incumbents or others. The one thing we learned from it, we didn't learn a lot like we thought we might, but we did learn that people who respond have traveled by train. So that led us to believe that the big problem, and we've worked on this, and maybe Richard will tell you some of the ways, we've worked on this by trying to educate people about trains. I feel all we need to do is just 
put them all in handcuffs on a bus, take them down to the Amtrak station, take them to Denver. And they'd come back and happy, and we'd, be, we'd get everything done. Okay, we may have to hold that off as a last resort. Uh, yes, yeah, right. <laughs> And not not the first play on the no, chessboard. No, no, no. That, yeah, that'd be farther down but, the chessboard. But education board. and experience are the two keys. And interestingly enough, in my conversations one-on-one -on -one with a number of the state legislators, many of them have gone to school on the East Coast or have traveled to the East Coast. They've experienced good rail public transit. Or Europe. If or they've Europe, been to or, Europe, they it's all over. They, they want it. Yeah. Or Japan, or China, or Russia, or France, or Great Britain. But here in the United States, we're way behind the rest of the world, and it's tragic. Now, an interesting statistic about Lincoln to Omaha is that the state DOT did a survey a number of years ago, and the cars that are going up and down the interstate have an average passenger load of 1.2 people. In other words, there are a lot of people driving. They're not carpooling. They're by themselves in the car. What a tremendous waste. Plus, what we're doing is we're spewing forth a bunch of bad emissions gas into the atmosphere. Have there been any studies done that show what it costs in hard dollars, the number of accidents that occur on Interstate 80 between Lincoln and Omaha each year? Is there a number that reflects the toll that driving on I-80 and incurring an accident uh, takes on Nebraska? I do not have the breakdown, but I can tell you that during 2019 statewide, the societal cost of driving and the accidents for the entire state was $1 billion. Now that's lost wages from the people that were killed, that's damage to the cars, that's medical bills for the people that had to go to the hospital, and that's lost wages for the people while they're in the hospital unable to work at their jobs. Okay. At, a, at a testimony or at a hearing, we had a testimony from a person from the state uh, safety bureau, and and she said uh, gave a lot of figures on just between Omaha and Lincoln because it's probably the most one of the more heavily traveled ones. Mm -hmm. The things that go on, and what's real sad in her testimony is that for a younger person who is often a victim, it's it's in the millions of dollars that we've lost, that society has lost by that person being killed in an auto accident. Yeah, okay, so we've talked about looking at this through a financial lens, through perhaps a common sense lens. Now let's talk a little bit about looking at it through an environmental lens. Uh, can you talk about the environmental impact of having a commuter railroad between Nebraska's two major cities? Uh, what, what do you have to say about that? Well, first of all, what we have to realize is that when we're talking the interstate, we're talking about a huge footprint. We're talking about a wide swath of land. And if we end up having to add another pair of lanes between Lincoln and Omaha, we're going to take even more land. The rail right away, for the most part, is about 100 feet wide. So the footprint of rail is much less, and we take fewer acres of crop, cropland out of production. Then we know this. We know that the rail mode, both freight and passenger, is the most environmentally friendly mode of any of the modes. The reason for that is the steel wheel of a rail car touching the top of the rail has an area of only about the size of a dime then think of the 18-wheeler with its 18 tires and big spongy tires, how much rolling resistance there is. So we can move a ton of freight or a ton of passengers on a rail line for a lot less fuel than we can any other mode. Has anybody uh, done a study that you're aware of um, about how much CO2 
is injected into the atmosphere annually by the traffic going between Omaha and Lincoln? Not exactly, but I can tell you this, and I think it's real important for all Nebraskans to realize this. That is that it used to be that coal-generating power plants that generate electricity were responsible for over 53% of the bad emissions. Then we've seen a shift where we're, the coal plants are being shut down, they're going to alternate fuel. Now, transportation creates over 50% of the harmful emissions in the United States. Okay. And also the, the State Department of Environment and Energy, as it's now referred to, does keep track of, of emissions and about what's happening. And certainly the Omaha or Douglas County Public Health, the Lancaster County Public Health, have those sorts of things. And DOT does. Mm. DOT has to do it to satisfy, you know, the environmental quality agencies at the federal level. Well, we know that Omaha, North Omaha specifically, because they uh, they mm. they marshaled this out by zip code. We know uh, definitively that yeah. North Omaha has the lowest life expectancy rate in Douglas County. And if you talk to the people at UNMC, they will tell you there are two reasons for that. One is the coal-fired plant in North Omaha, and the second is a part of the interstate loops into North Omaha, so it has the worst air in Nebraska, and it makes Omaha number nine in the country, in the country, uh, as the ninth worst place to live for asthmatics. Uh, so there's a direct connection that UNMC makes and the Douglas County Health Department makes by examining life expectancy rates in the zip codes in Douglas County. Uh, so there's, there's that uh, as well. And, and, and you're, as a passenger in a car, you're exposed to that because you're pulling in the air. If you're traveling in a controlled environment like a railroad, you know, they can put in air filters as they do. And, yeah. and you're yeah. not getting outside air, you're getting air that's been run through certain sort of cleaning devices. We know for a fact that two years ago, State Senator Adam Moorfeld introduced a bill along the lines of creating this commuter railroad between Omaha and Lincoln. We know that this legislative session, Carol Blood, a state senator from Bellevue, introduced, so we have a Lincoln Center and Omaha Center introducing similar legislation. Neither one of those bills got out of committee. Why is that, and what is the solution well, to I, getting it out of committee. I guess I'll go back to the comments I made about the survey we did of candidates and of incumbents in the legislative branches. And they're, I don't think the, they're well aware of what we're talking about. They aren't aware of the huge economic impacts that rail and commuter rail can have, not only on the two cities, but everything in between. And, and we aren't going to get into that in detail now, but it happens. And so it, it's a matter of educating them. Uh, and also it's a matter of trying to put that in the upper part of their interest level. You know, in other words, there are a lot of things they're faced with dealing all the time. And passenger rail is not one of them. In fact, I'm always surprised at the number of state senators that are amazed when I tell them that we have Amtrak trains through Nebraska twice a day. Mm -hmm. and have had for, for years, you know. So is there a strategy that you are aware of uh, or that you have developed to up the education level on the committee so it can get out and get on the floor for a vote? What's the strategy that can make that happen? Well, first of all, we have to dispel the myth that this is going to be so expensive that the state can't afford it. And we have a model, which Bob mentioned, it's called SMART, that's Sonoma Marin County uh, Transportation District. They have a line that runs about 70 or 80 miles, which is comparable to Lincoln to Omaha. What they have is they have what we call diesel multiple unit cars, and they're two car sets, and you can couple those sets. You can 
use just like building blocks. So you can vary your train length depending upon the demand for a given time of day. And we think this would work real well for Lincoln to Omaha. And at a luncheon last year for the senators, we had a rather extensive presentation that showed pictures of the smart system, of the shops, of the stations, and so on. So what we really need to do is just show people what's out there. And it's everywhere except in Nebraska. Well, so, and we have changed our strategy a little bit. Uh, prior to last year, we had usually an annual meeting, and it was to talk about Nebraska's involvement in sort of a regional structure. And we won't go into the details of it. It's a good structure, but we won't dwell on it, and we weren't getting any place. So that's when we decided, after our survey, we need to educate. So last year was our first attempt, pandemic and all, we delivered lunches to their offices, and we had about 20 senators or their staff members take part in a one-hour session where we talked about SMART, we talked about other things about railroads. So, you know, here we sit in the university campus, education. Yeah, okay, all right. And, um, and the other thing I think is we do work with individual senators. And Richard is our, we have two lobbyists, Richard and the president of our organization. And Richard is the penultimate, you know, every morning when you open your door, there's Richard asking about rails. And that's needed. You know, it's, it's not a, a simple thing to get people to change tracks. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, I think we're about out of track. Uh, bad pun intended. <laughs> Are there any final comments that uh, you would like to make for this session? Uh, Richard, we'll start with you. You have a closing statement that you'd like to make? I do. And my closing statement is that I have ridden the bullet train in Japan from Tokyo to Osaka. Uh, I've ridden uh, the subway system in New York City. Uh, I've ridden trains in Canada and in Mexico. And so I've, I've seen what's out there. And I just like Nebraska to, you know, become modern and have something similar to what we see everywhere else in the world. And that's my dream. I hope I see it in my lifetime. Okay. And my dream is to have more people join our organization, not just to join our organization, to, but to become advocates for what we've been talking about. The, the next chance coming up will be the 24th or 25th of this month, the Saturday, uh, and we'll have a board meeting and people can zoom into it. They can search ProRail Nebraska, P-R-O-R-A-I-L, Nebraska, and, and just put that on your Google or whatever search you use, and it'll take you to, it's a train website thing, but it's just ours. Uh, yeah, it's uh, trainweb.org, and then ProRail Nebraska. And it's a wonderfully simple, non-sophisticated site. Best kind. They can go to our website, which has a lot of very basic information, and they'll be amazed what is going on, and we need them to join us, not, not necessarily as members, but to join us in the effort, because it's going to take a few people, you know, and we get 20 down there camping out on an unknown a center I won't mention the name of, and maybe they'd think differently. Okay. All right. Excellent. We really appreciate you taking the time to go over uh, this, and uh, uh, we will do this again sometime when we have a little bit more information, and it's a little farther down the track. Uh, we'll come back and do this again, but for now, we thank you very much. Thank you.